clear that the starting point in design and assessment task is to select the intended learning outcomes and guarantee the consistency among them and the task proposed to students. Once this is done, how do we proceed? Which are the key elements to be taken into account in the design of such an assessment? The first step is to identify the most suitable tests which can assess the intended learning outcomes. Test formats can vary a lot, mainly depending on the type of stimulus that they provide, with the type of answer that is required from students. When working with soft skills, therefore, it is not important to verify if students are able and good in recalling or understanding previous knowledge. What matters is how a certain behavior explicitated through the ILO is acted. So the test in this context is the observation and assessment done by the teacher or by peers of the performance of that behavior based on certain criteria previously established. Do you remember the intended learning outcome presented in a previous lesson? In such a case, which test should we design? Any idea? A proposal can be to ask students in groups to explore and critically review evidence coming from literature and outcomes from a relevant role play simulation. They have to organize a kickoff meeting to set teamwork activity during the week. In such a situation, the teacher, if there are a few teams or a team member, will observe how the work proceeds inside each group, how peers interact, using a set of criteria that guides them in taking into consideration the same categories. Through this activity, we create a situation in which students are required to act according to a specific skill, while establishing schedules and coordinating the activities of the team, negotiating decisions, understanding and respecting competencies of other team members. Once the test is settled, the criteria and indicators need to be elaborated. Such activity can be done by the teacher or in collaboration with students who contribute in their definition and development. A rubric can respond perfectly to this objective. As defined by Reddy and Andrade, a rubric is a document with a list of assessment criteria, a scoring strategy and quality definitions normally stated on a scale that describes what students need to take into account to demonstrate a particular level of performance. If you look at this example of analytical rubric, you can immediately understand how it works. In the first column are listed the criteria you want to investigate, ideally the ILO to be assessed, while in the others are detailed the scale and scoring that describes the level of mastery, excellent, good, etc., and the description of the different levels of performance quality, performance descriptors, of the component dimensions at each level of mastery. Think to our example. With the rubric, we can indicate different criteria that can refer to different aspects of the performance students performed. Management skills, active listening, clarity in communication, negotiation, etc. For each criteria, we can detail indicators based on the chosen scale. The more detailed the rubric, the better students will visualize each single aspect and behavior that compose a specific skill. Through the rubric, students can reflect on their own performance and on the other's one if peer assessment takes place, having in mind which are the levels of the intended performance, from the best to the worst, and then better understand their strengths and weaknesses. The rubric, if rich and well articulated, also represents a good way to pass the feedback. Think about a large class. A rubric can be a powerful tool to fasten the process for students to understand how their performance went and how to improve it. So, 
Once identified the criteria we wanted to assess and how, we can proceed with the concrete assessment task that needs to be followed by providing feedback to those who performed the test. The feedback, in particular when working on soft skills development, becomes the key message that guides students' progress in improving such skills. In our context, when soft skills are promoted in a disciplinary course, what usually happens is that the activity developed with the aim to improve soft skills is often connected with a performance or output production related to the specific subject to which a score is assigned. It is normal that when the students see the score, they don't think about the feedback anymore. So it is crucial to highlight its importance in class with students and find strategies to remind them to use it. Also, quality of feedback represents an important element to be considered as it is strongly connected to the quality of the learning experience. A few decades ago, Hattie demonstrated the strong correlation between the quality and the frequency of feedback and the results of students. More recently, Ramsden highlighted how there is a very strong correlation between quality and frequency of feedback and the perceived quality of the course. In practice, Every time a course is negatively considered by students, there is also a negative specific perception in terms of quality of feedback. To be effective, however, the feedback should have certain characteristics. First of all, it should be provided promptly and often. Often, because within the dynamic of teaching and learning, the student should try to give a performance to which the teacher then should provide feedback. Promptly, because when I carry out a task or any kind of performance in a given moment, receiving feedback very late in time doesn't allow me to understand if the learning process is following the proper path. It should also allow students to understand clearly at what level they are positioning themselves compared to the intended performance. Am I actually at the highest intended level? Am I at least on an, an acceptable level? If I'm not an acceptable level, why? A good feedback should let students know what they can do to correct the learning process or further improve it. With these three characteristics, we can effectively create meaningful feedback. There is an element that is even more qualitative, which is perhaps the most important. Feedback should also support and foster self-esteem, not exclusively underline the issues, the mistakes, but also focus on students' strengths and effective behaviors. Carol Dweck at Stanford University made a very interesting consideration with her growing mindset model, a perspective of potential growth and development of the abilities, knowledge and competencies of students. Through her studies, she highlighted how learning situations in which teachers encourage the creation of a growing mindset effectively favor the achievement of the best results. It may sound intuitive, because when we open someone up to the hope that they can achieve better results, we automatically put them in the condition to deploy all the resources they possess in that direction. It's not so easy to put that into feedback practice though, because we often limit ourselves to underlying everything that has not worked out. Moreover, we have to keep in mind that we are working around behaviors, something that changes according to many stimuli and is not right or wrong. The same behavior can be effective when acted in a specific context or moment of the assessed performance and be dysfunctional in different scenarios with different people or simply in a different moment of the performance. We need to dedicate and spend time on the encouragement through good feedback of all the positive potentials that could help our students enter a positive perspective. Mm -hmm.